those numbers. And because it was assumed that he also gave the Soviets the H-bomb, because he was working on that as well, that in part propelled Harry Truman to inaugurate America's H-bomb program. However, the H-bomb procedure that Fuchs knew turned out not to work. So it's one of the many ironies. Uh, here is Kitty Oppenheimer. <clears throat> J. Roberts' wife. <clears throat> and it's hard to find kind of a positive assessment of Kitty. Uh, she, all the accounts are very hard on her. Uh, part of it may be due to her place in time. Uh, this is a time when women were expected to talk about more pr uh, sort of trivial things, but she wanted to talk about deep and fundamental things. Uh, and here is, all right, now it is time to test this uh, weapon. They have two kinds of weapons uh, uh, being built at Los Alamos. The Hiroshima weapon was such that they never field tested it. They were so confident that it would work and that they never tested it in the field. Um, but the plutonium weapon was much more complicated. And so they wanted a field test. And they had sufficient plutonium. So now the question was, where should the field test be held? <clears throat> they looked at the coast of California. But General Patton was doing uh, tank maneuvers there. They looked at the Mal Pais, just south of Grants. And it was, now it's a national monument. But the, they were thinking, all right, perhaps it could be set off there. But the photographers protested that they needed a flat piece of land so they could get an uh, incredible photographic record. So they chose an area that had already been taken over by the government, <clears throat> the, what is now the White Sands Missile Range, then the Alamogordo Bombing Range. And they took a corner of it. And the Secretary of the Interior had issued strict orders that no Indian should be displaced, uh, period, for the atomic test. So they took over this northeast corner, uh, uh, northwest corner, of the uh, El Morota bombing range. And the assumption was, uh, the people who had given their land to the government, the assumption was they would get the land back after the war was over. But this, of course, is going to make this impossible. Now, if you've never been to the Trinity site, it, this is what it looks like. It's pretty bleak. People are trying to homestead it, which always just astounds me. It's a day and a half wagon drive to Socorro. Uh, and at this is Kenneth Bainbridge, who is the person in charge of the uh, base camp laboratory at Trinity site just east of Socorro. <clears throat> and this is the base camp. <clears throat> they sent down a group of MPs in January, and they were there through the test, which was in July, and they were not allowed to leave. <clears throat> they were not allowed to leave even to go to Socorro. <clears throat> now, the director, the lieutenant in charge, did everything possible to keep them sane. They showed movies every night on a big screen. <clears throat> They played polo. He brought down polo. <clears throat> they played polo with brooms. <clears throat> and the, the MPs contingent was stu were stuck there in the desert for six months. The only thing was they did get an eventual citation from the Army. They had the lowest VD rate in the entire <laughs> Army. <clears throat> <clears throat> the, this is the, the McDonald Ranch House. This is one of the homesteaders. They're trying to homestead this region. Uh, and this was taken over. And if you visit the site, and I highly recommend it, uh, you can tour the McDonald Ranch House and see where the components of the bomb were put together. <clears throat> now here is a, the, uh, there were two McDonald's. This is the brother. And this is a site that people do not get to see, but we were on a special tour, and we did. It's a, the, the climate is pretty hard on these buildings. Now, they built three bunkers, earth and concrete bunkers, um, filled with instruments. This is the world's largest outdoor laboratory. And you can see all the wires, and those will go to ground zero. The first ground zero, uh, the Twin Towers take their name from the Trinity site. <clears throat> Here are the wires. They're roughly the height of an average person. <clears throat> and this area was filled with antelope. 
and the antelope would come racing through and they would either leap over or duck under the wires. <clears throat> the wires are going from the various bunkers to ground zero for the incredible instrumentation that was produced in just a fraction of a second because, of course, then everything explodes. This is one of the bunkers. This is a West 10,000. <clears throat> Very, very uh, small. Uh, this, I'm, so this is not West Sandals. This is a, a photographic bunker. And then here is Jumbo. Uh, this, this is the largest device ever hauled by rail during World War II. Uh, and it's a huge something. They had to go special route because the bridges couldn't take it. And this, this is what it is. It's a gigantic thermos. And they had, uh, they put it on this device and they hauled it. And the plan was, if the bomb did not go off at Trinity site, <clears throat> as expected, because it's a plutonium core surrounded by conventional explosives, uh, they, the plan was they would stick the bomb inside of Jumbo, 220 ton steel thermos. And if the bomb didn't go off as intended, they could send a recovery team in and bring the plutonium back out. That was the plan. Uh, so here they are, 220 ton thermos. And they're gonna, now six weeks before the test, they decided that their calculations were sufficient, that they didn't need jumbo. So now what do you do with it? <laughs> they put a special rack for it about three fourths of a mile from ground zero. Uh, presumably as a test to see what an atomic bomb would do to an enemy's 220-ton thermos. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, pri prior to the test, which was on July 16th, they set off the world's largest man-made explosion up until this time, 100 tons of TNT. There they are, on a wooden platform. Um, they put some radioactive materials in there. They blew it up. And then they tested where the wind would take the radioactive materials. And much to their dismay, it took the materials right over the town of Roswell, which is not what they want. They want the, the cloud to go north, northeast, because that was the least inhabited part of the state of New Mexico at that time. <clears throat> so here's the tower. Um, it was manufactured in the east. It was erected here. And the bomb, it's not really a bomb, they called it the gadget, is on top of the tower. <clears throat> and here they are hoisting it to the top. And you'll see here, these are mattresses. <clears throat> and someone got the idea that uh, it's a long way up for, for, uh, to the top. And when it was halfway up, they put the mattresses underneath. Not that it would explode, but if something did happen, things might be damaged on the outside. So there are the mattresses as a security precaution. <laughs> There's a picture. The bomb is completely assembled atop the 100-foot tower. The University of New Mexico Press published a photograph like this, which showed the wiring. And <laughs> the security asked them in the next edition, to delete this, uh, <clears throat> this image, because you can see the wiring. <clears throat> now, here is the photographic. This is the world's most photographed event up until this time. Uh, there are m literally millions of photographs of it. Uh, and Berlin Brixner, who is still living, uh, was the, one of the main photographers. So frequently, you will see these photos by Brixner. Uh, he didn't take them personally, uh, but he was sort of set up the cameras, many of them automatic, some handheld. But here we go, six thousandths of a second. <clears throat> Tenth of a second. And then this is the most famous uh, image. The, 